the most important thing in Islam is aqidah. Without it, you cannot be classified as a Muslim. Because aqidah means your belief. So if you don't know who your Lord is, Azza wa Jal, if you don't know what are the things that you're commanded to do, if you don't know your messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even if you pray 500 rak'ahs a day, even if you fast not only Ramadan, the whole year, all of this would not help you a bit at all. Therefore, yani, we thought that during this blessed month of Ramadan, we go through the basics. There are technical books in Aqidah that may confuse you a bit according to your level of knowledge. But this is the common mistakes that Muslims do when they try to jump the ladder two steps at a time. And sometimes they just want to go to the top without taking the basics. This book, Thalafat al-Usul, is one of the basics that students of knowledge learn. It gives you an insight of what your belief should be like. Children in Islamic environments in so many countries, not only in Saudi Arabia, also in Sudan, also in Nigeria itself, they study this book and memorize it by heart since a very young age. Alongside with Al-Qawaid Al-Arba, which is very, very little and short, alongside with Kitab al-Tawheed, and so on. And these great publications were written by the late Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, may Allah have mercy on his soul, one of the great reformers of our times, who did not invent a new madhab. He was a Hanbali by fiqh. And he did not invent anything new in Aqidah because he was almost identical to Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn al Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on their souls. But he faced a lot of hatred due to the fact that he came to take the people out of what they were used to for so long. And that is worshipping idols, devoting ibadah to other than Allah. And hence he was met with fierce resistance from the super Sufis, from the idol worshippers, the grave worshippers, from the Rafida and the Shia, because he brought the people back to the basics, to the Quran and to the Sunnah, purifying their aqidah from any impurities that were attached to it throughout the years of ignorance. So this book, inshallah, would open our eyes. And I presume that most of you know what we are going to talk about, but it is more of an eye opener, inshallah, to all of us. I sincerely don't know how long will this take us, but with this lockdown, alhamdulillah, what better time to be spent rather than in seeking knowledge and getting to know Allah Azza wa Jal better. So we begin inshallah Azza wa Jal by uh, Brother Nasser reading the English text. And if needed, we will comment on it bi innillahi Azza wa Jal. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. This no is known to the scholars and the students of, uh, of, of knowledge as a tasmiya. Bismillah. Mm. In Arabic, it is jar wa majroor. And I'm not going to go into grammar because this would take us more than Ramadan, inshallah. But the, to sum things up, they say that Bismillah means in the name of Allah. And then there is a verb that depends on what you're doing. So now we're about to read. So when we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, this means that in the name of Allah, 
the most gracious, the most merciful, I begin reading. If I want to eat, I say, Bismillah. While I intend by saying, Bismillah, I'm going to eat. I'm beginning to eat. So having the name of Allah inaugurating and beginning every act we do, this is seeking blessings from Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is done in so many things. When we enter the masjid, uh, when we have uh, intimacy with our spouses, we say, Bismillah, Allahumma jannibna shaytanu jannib shaytan ma razaqtana. When we start to slaughter an animal, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and the list goes on. So rarely you will find people beginning their talk, their books, their lectures without Bismillah. Yes, a lot of the scholars and da'is may begin with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Muhammad. Yet there is a hadith it's a different opinion among scholars whether it's authentic or not that any subject that is begun without bismillah it is cut so to complete your subject you have to begin with the name of allah azza wa jal and i won't go into the meaning of ar-rahman which is a name of allah azza wa jal that can't be used with anyone else but him we find people in uh, the subcontinent in the UK, their name is Rahman. They drop Abdullah or, or, or Abd, Abdul Rahman. So they call people, uh, hey Rahman, what's happening? This is totally prohibited. There are names of Allah Azza wa Jal that can only be used by him. And the first and uh, utmost name of Allah is Allah. All the names go back to him. So when someone says, what is Allah? Nobody says Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Rather, when someone says, what is the meaning of Ar-Rahim? You say it's the name of Allah. What's the meaning of Ar-Rahman? It's the name of Allah. All names and attributes go back to Allah. So Allah is the name. And you have to know that Ar-Rahman is also can only be given to Allah. There are names that can be shared. So, for example, Rahim. Can we call someone Rahim? Hey, Rahim, what, what are you having lunch tomorrow? No problem. Aziz. Allah described Yusuf in the Quran as Al Aziz or Aziz of Misr. There's no problem. Hakim. My name is Asim Al Hakim. Again, there's no problem. Al Sami' Al Basir. All of these can be shared, but there are names that only Allah Azza wa Jal can uh, uh, be called with, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Yes, Akhi. No, may Allah have mercy on you that we are obligated to learn four matters. First... Okay, first of all, he says no. So, Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab is addressing the students, and he's using this kind way of addressing them by bringing their attention by saying no and then he says rahimakallah what does rahimakallah mean it means that may allah have mercy on you and it is always good and great to make dua whenever you speak to someone i remember that for so many years in arabic i say this a lot Whenever someone does something for me, I usually say, Rahim Allah waldeik, ghafar Allah walak, bayyad Allah wajhak. All of these means to, may Allah forgive your sins, may Allah have mercy on your parents, may Allah uh, uh, give you brightness in your face. And people are amazed. So, Sheikh, you say so many good things. I never pay attention to it. It's just the habit. Instead of th saying thank you or jazakallahu khayran, I make dua for people and they love it when you say may allah have mercy on your parents they love it so it's always good rather it's always excellent when we make dua before addressing people this increases the positivity when you go 
to people and start pointing out their mistakes. They will feel offended. But when you give them dua and you're kind to them and you show the good things in them and then you point out their faults, they would tend to accept this. So the Sheikh says, I'lam rahimak Allah. No, may Allah have mercy on you. That we must learn four basic matters. I'm reading for, from a, def, a different uh, translation, but it's the same thing. Yeah, and it's close by, so don't worry. It's the same textbook. So there are four matters that the Sheikh, the Imam, wants to bring our attention to that are essential that we learn and know. So the first one. Nasser? Yeah, the first one is um, first knowledge, which means awareness of Allah and awareness of his prophet and awareness of the religion of Islam based on evidence. Okay, so the first most important matter that you have to know is to know Allah Azza wa Jal. And to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not something theoretical. So when someone asks you, who's your Lord? So Allah. Okay, what do you mean by that? Um, that he's Allah. No, you have to have the conviction in your heart that Allah Azza wa Jal is our creator, is our provider, is our owner, is the giver of life and death, is the facilitator of all our affairs. So you know Allah Azza wa Jal with your heart, a knowledge that makes you submit to Allah's commands. And this here, we have a huge gap between what is supposed to be and what is the reality. So most people say, yes, I, I, I worship Allah Azza wa Jal. I, I know Allah. But when you come and examine and scrutinize their lives, you will feel that this can't be a Muslim. All the things that he's doing goes against Allah's will. And he doesn't submit his will to Allah. He doesn't feel like a servant to Allah. He may complain and say, why Allah have you done this to me? Why do you hate me? How can you dare and speak to Allah like this? Yeah, Sheikh, he said that so many times. I asked Allah for so many things and he never replied to me. Subhanallah. Now, can we classify this brother to be a real Muslim? This is just a glimpse of what true knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal we require. And to know his prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam, his messenger. So when someone says, I know the messenger of Allah Azza wa Jal, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, <laughs> what do you know about him? We find zero. Do you find, do you know the name of his mother, his father? You know his daughters, his sons, his wives? You know about his battles, his suffering in Mecca for 13 years? You do know his biography, his seerah? And the people say, mm, unfortunately not. Do you know Cristiano Ronaldo? Or Muhammad Salah of Liverpool. So, oh yeah, man, I know that his daughter is called Mecca, and I don't know if he's going to get another daughter and call her Medina, and maybe the third one he's called Al Quds. Subhanallah. You know everything, actually. But when it comes to your Prophet, والسلام, whom Allah ordered you to love more than yourself and your parents and your wife and your children, you're ignorant. You know nothing. And then you're proud to say, yeah, yeah I'm a Muslim. Subhanallah. The first matter you should learn is knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge which is to know Allah. Know Allah through what? Through his signs and creations. To know the Prophet of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, And to know the religion of Islam with supporting evidences. This is the first matter, by the way, huh? And yes. by the way, you have to know these questions because you will have to answer them in your grave. When you're set in light in your grave, 
there will come two horrible angels. And they're intimidating, they're frightening, they're scary. And they tell you, who's your Lord? What is your religion? And who is your messenger? If you don't walk the talk in this life and know these things and act upon them, <laughs> you're in deep doo-doo. You are doomed because only those who walk the talk will be able to answer. And we will get to get to talk about this again, inshallah. Yes, Akhi. Second, acting on this. So the first is knowledge. The second matter is acting upon this. Application of this knowledge. I could go to Harvard. I could go to Yale. And I could see PhD holders knowing maybe more than I do. And they can write books and theses and essays about aqidah, about the knowledge of Allah and the Prophet and the religion, but they do not walk the talk. They do not implement it and act upon it like the hypocrites. They know, but they don't act. So this is something that is essential for you learning aqidah to know and also to act upon, okay? Yes, Nasser. Nasser, it's not coffee break yet. We have probably trouble with the internet. Okay, until we re are rejoined by Nasser, the third is calling people to it. What is meant by calling people? Internet is fine. Okay, alhamdulillah. Zakumullah khair. So can you all hear me and see me? Yes, that's good. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so the third one is calling people to it. So I know Allah Azza wa Jal, the Prophet Islam and my religion. I act according to my religion and according to the commands of Allah and the Prophet Islam. There is a third thing that is needed, which is to call people to it. It's not sufficient to be selfish, to be a monk in a room or in a temple on top of a mountain, worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal and neglecting everyone else. No, you have to walk the talk. You have to go down and you have to call the people to what you believe. And this is the benefit of knowledge. If I were to sit with someone and talk to him and he asks me four or five questions and then I would feel inferior. I would feel agitated because I'm unable to answer him and I start swearing at him, maybe attacking him. This is from shaitan. Why? Because shaitan is utilizing my ignorance to make me look bad. But if I have knowledge, I can call him to Islam. And this is the message. And this is the role of all prophets of Allah. They knew. They acted upon. And they called their people. And they called everyone to what they believe. To share this greatness with them. Number four. Are you with us, Nasser? Yes, I'm with you now. Number four, patience with the harm that befalls, befalls, that befalls due to it. Patience so, with the harm that befalls you due yeah. to it. Okay. So, in short, to be patient. Why? Because when you have knowledge and when you act upon it and when you call people to it, they're not going to leave you alone. They're going to abuse you. They're going to harass you. They're going to attack you. Look what had happened to all messengers and prophets of Allah since the beginning of time. All of them were attacked 
harassed, accused of being crazy, accused of being uh, uh, um, soothsayers, poets, all of these bad things that were attached to them simply because they called the people to worship Allah. Subhanallah. So if you are on the straight path, you are definitely will need to be patient and to accept the harm that will come to you. Because if people don't harm you, there's something wrong in your da'wah. If everybody is okay with you, if the superpowers are okay with you, if the non-Muslims are okay with you and they're sending you gifts and invitation cards, huh, there's something wrong with your da'wah. You're not calling to the right Islam because the Prophet himself, alayhi salatu wasalam, suffered greatly throughout his year, 23 years giving da'wah. At the end, Mother Aisha said, he could only pray while sitting down because of the problems and the things that the Muslims and the people brought onto him. He was so tired and worn out because of that. So nothing comes easy. And this is known from the life story of the messengers of Allah. Okay. The proof for this is Allah saying, so this, do you have the translation? Yes. In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the bestower of mercy. By the time, verily, mankind is lost, except for those who believe and perform righteous deeds and advise one another towards the truth and advise one another towards patience. So these four things are crystal clear in this magnificent surah. Subhanallah, all the people on earth, if, we, if they were to collaborate and just bring us one surah of a number of words, they cannot. It cannot be but divine from Allah. This is the word of Allah, the Almighty sums it all up in well asr by time allah azza wa jal swears by any of his creation we cannot swear except by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so allah swears by time man is at or in loss by default mankind is in loss except so this exception is what we had just talked about knowledge in belief is knowledge implementing and acting upon what you know they call people and recommend one another with the truth this is calling people and they advise one another and recommend to one another to be patient and tolerant and this is what you will see if you read the Quran, if you're fortunate to read the Quran, you will find, for example, in the surah that all Imams usually read in Fajr prayer of a Jum'ah. They read in the beginning uh, uh, surah, in the second rak'ah, they read surah Al-Insan. And in the end, towards the end, six, seven, Verses before the end, Allah says, Inna nahnu nazalna al We that Allah have revealed unto you the Quran. You would expect that after this ayah, Allah would say, So be grateful, be thankful, show your gratitude. No. Allah says, Fasbir li hukmi rabbika. Be patient to your Lord's commands, meaning that Allah is giving his messenger a heads up that due to the Quran that we reveal to you, you will suffer and people will show their enmity and hatred to you. So be patient. So this beautiful surah, Imam Shafi, what did he say? Imam Shafi said, may Allah have mercy on him, said, 
had Allah not sent down a proof to his creation other than this surah, that is Surah Al-Asr, it would have been sufficient for them. So Imam Shafi'i says and believes that this surah is so magnificent that it would have sufficed humanity if only they would ponder and contemplate upon it. Wallahi, it is a short surah that we lazy imams, whenever it is Maghrib, we just read it because we want to get the prayer over with. So Al-Asr, inna l-insana la fi khusri al-ladhina amana amul al-salihati wa tawasa wa al-haqqi wa tawasa wa al-sabr. Allahu Akbar. So short, so beautiful. People, when they hear the imam saying, Walla Asr, they say, As-salam. But if he, they hear him say, Alif, Lam, Meem, and they say, Ya Latif, we are doomed, man. <laughs> Why? Because we don't have the knowledge. The knowledge of Allah, the knowledge of the religion, the knowledge of the Prophet, had we had, had we known Allah, Azza wa Jal, we would never feel fed up or tired or even bored from reciting and listening to Allah's beautiful words. Yes, Akhi. Salam. Yes. Al Bukhari, may Allah have mercy on him, said. Of course, Al Bukhari, you all know that he is Imam Muhammad ibn Ismail al Bukhari, the compiler of Sahih al Bukhari, the most authentic book after the Quran on earth, which Muslims rely on and believe to be the most authentic book after the Quran. What does Imam Bukhari say in his book? Now, remember, Sahih al-Bukhari is not a book of uh, uh, people's words. Imam Malik said, Imam Ahmad said, and then looking into the different opinions of scholars. No, no. The Bukhari structured his book, Sahih, according to chapters. So the chapter of Ilm, chapter of Bid al-Wahi, chapter of Iman, chapter of Salat, chapter of Tafsir, chapter of Jihad, etc. And he would bring a title, then a hadith or two, maybe more, maybe less, and then he moves on. Scholars say that the knowledge of Imam Bukhari, because this is not something he's writing for himself. He's just narrating, reporting hadiths. They said that his knowledge, his fiqh, is illustrated in this title. So before he mentions an ayah or a, uh, uh, a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, he goes to tell you that this is my fiqh. So before he narrates or reports the hadith, he puts to you what? The tarjama. Therefore they say, fiqh al-Bukhari fi tarajimih. The knowledge and the fiqh of Bukhari is in the tarjama. So what does a Bukhari say? He said in this chapter, knowledge comes from knowledge comes before speech and action, where he brought the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where Allah says, فَعَلَمْ عَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكْ So know that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and seek forgiveness for your sins. So he began so he began by mentioning knowledge before speech and action. So what does this mean? Imam Bukhari looked at this ayah. Fa'lam, let it be no, O Muhammad. That there is no God worthy of being worshipped except Allah. And then seek forgiveness and seek Allah's forgiveness for uh, your sin and those who follow you. And Imam Bukhari looked at this ayah and said, oh, Allah made knowledge come prior to acting upon it. And this is why in the four matters we spoke about, the first matter is knowledge. The second matter is to implement it and to act upon it. So even Imam Bukhari looked at this ayah and made this as a title for this chapter. And he went on to mention that knowledge is more important than action. Because with knowledge, 
you have the driver to act upon it, while actions by themselves without knowledge may take you to hell. Look at the monks, look at the priests who worship Allah Azza wa Jal for days without end. But on what? On falsehood. They have gone astray because they do not possess the knowledge that is needed. I think um, we should stop here, Nasser. Yes, yes, and take questions, inshallah. Take questions, inshallah. Inshallah, tabarakallah. So uh, we'll just go to the Q&A session and then we'll address some few questions. So uh, this one is asking, uh, Assalamu alaikum. What is the ruling regarding khunut in Witr? Is it before ruku or after ruku? Okay. The most authentic opinion is that khunut with a ta and not with a ta. When you say khunut, and there is qalqala in the, at the end, there is a ta in Arabic, qunut means to despair from Allah's mercy. And this is a major sin. While qunut with a slight t, qunut means or has two meanings. One, to prolong standing in prayer. Allah says, وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ Stand to Allah Azza wa Jal in silence. Do not speak. Do not talk because this is salat. And the qunut here means also to prolong reciting the Quran for long uh, uh, hours or long time, maybe not hours. The other meaning of qunut is the dua, which was not ever reported to us that the Prophet had done it, alayhi salatu was salam in Witr. So if the Prophet didn't do it in Witr, why are we doing it? Well, there is an authentic hadith that Al-Hasan ibn Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. And at the time, Al-Hasan was like seven, eight years of age. And he came to the Prophet والسلام, asking him to teach him a dua to recite in Qunut. And this hadith is mind-blowing. A child of seven or eight, even nine years of age, coming to his grandfather to ask him for money to buy PUBG or to ask him for permission to go to the fun fairs. No. Al-Hasan ibn Ali was one of the great imams of Islam. Some even classify him as the fifth caliph because he reigned for six months and he was the Khalifa after his father Ali. And then he gave up the throne to reconcile between the Muslim factions and allowed Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, may Allah be peace with the man with his father to rule the Muslims. So this young boy is an Imam. And the Prophet acknowledged this when he was young. So he said, teach me. So the Prophet taught him how to say Dua al-Qunut which is Allahumma hadini fi man hadayt, wa aafini fi man aafayt, wa tawallani fi man tawallayt, wa barik li fi ma aatayt, wa asrif anni sharra ma qadayta, fa inna ka taqdi wa la yukda alayka, inna hu la yadillu man walayta, wa la yizzu man aadayt, tabarakta rabbana wa ta'alayt. That's it. And now, people had taken this and made a long hours of dua based on it. The dua that was taught by our Prophet Asam was short. So they said, oh, it's okay to add something because it's a place for dua. So I said, okay, add something. So they added a phrase or two. Beautiful. From the hadith. Then they added two, three more duas. Then another 10. Then another 50. And nowadays we find people in Taraweeh, in Witcher, you time it. And it's about 20 minutes of dua. What are you doing? You broke my shoulders saying, I mean, I mean. The Quran you recited was, Allah's beautiful words were four sentences. And now you're giving 20 minutes in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. 
after the khatim of the Quran or what they call Laylat al-Qadr, it may go to 35 to 40 minutes. And this is extremism. This is not from the Sunni. Going back to your question, should it be before the Rukur or after the Rukur? The vast majority of scholars say that it is done after you rise up from Rukur saying, Sami Allahu liman hamidah, Rabbana wa lakal hamd, Allahumma adina fi And if you do it before uh, uh, Rukur, this is applicable and, and possible with some uh, schools of thought, but this is not the most authentic and Allah knows best. Um, second question, Sheikh. Uh, what is the what is more virtuous, Tarawi or Tahajjud? What is more? No, sir. What is more? What? Okay, we, I think we've lost Nasser. No problem. Akhi, there is an umbrella. This is called night prayer. Underneath the umbrella, there are branches of it. Such as, not, uh, uh, we have tahajjud. And tahajjud is usually prayed after sleeping, usually. But if someone does not sleep, then he can pray tahajjud. And the best time of tahajjud is the last third of the night. So if you have from sunset till Adhan of Fajr, nine hours. So the last third would be three hours before Fajr. Now, also we have something called Taraweeh. And Taraweeh is not prayed except during the month of Ramadan in congregation. If women want to pray night prayer in Ramadan home, it's not called Taraweeh, it's called night prayer. And this is why it is best that you pray your Taraweeh if you're praying at home at the last third of the night. So nowadays we have lockdown. When do I pray Taraweeh? I do not pray it after Isha. I go to bed, wake up before Fajr time. So I offer my, tar my Taraweeh, which is night prayer to Hajjud. And I also have Sahur, the pre-dawn meal. And then we pray Fajr. So the umbrella of night prayer underneath it is tahajjud, taraweeh, witr. They're all called night prayer or qiyamul layl. Yes, sir. Now, what is the ruling on a woman praying with her feet open? Where, I mean, she's not <laughs> covering her feet. With her feet open is yes. problematic. Um, okay, this is an issue of dispute. The vast majority of scholars say that the whole of women during prayer is awra, except for their faces and their hands. That's it. The feet are also awra, and they're especially awra when she goes out of her home because all of her body is awra with the difference of opinion whether the face and the hands are or not. During prayer, there's, inshallah, no difference or great difference that she's allowed to uh, uncover her face or she's obliged to uncover her face and hands. The feet is an issue of dispute. Some scholars say that it is not part of the aura. Others say it is part of the aura. And I'm inclined to the latter opinion that it is aura and women must cover them when they pray or when they leave their homes and Allah knows best. MashaAllah, Sheikh, the next question is, um, if there is no male in the house, can a woman lead the Tarawi prayer? If there are women in the, uh, if there are men, if there are men in the house, but they are mahram. And there, are, there is a mother and her sister and her daughter, and they want to pray jama'ah, congregation, women only, there's no problem in that, whether there are men or not. If there are non mahram men, then she should not raise her voice because an al-mahram must not hear a woman reciting the Quran. But if there are only her mahrams, husband, father, brother, then there's no problem in a woman leading only women. A woman cannot at all lead a male worshiper. 
where does a woman stand? She stands in the same line of the other women. Men usually stand in the front, the imam, and behind him, the congregation. With women, no, they all stand in one line and their imam is in between them. On her right, on her left, there are worshippers. Yes, sir. MashaAllah. Uh, Sheikh, the next question is, uh, what is the ruling of a sister on her period carrying the Quran in order to read it in this blessed month? The majority of scholars say that holding the Mus'haf, the Arabic Quran, the book, for a woman in her period or in her menses is prohibited. This is the opinion of the majority of scholars. Ibn Hazm differed. Sheikh al-Albani followed and it's safer to stick with the vast majority of muslims now having said that if she wears gloves and she holds a mushaf there's no problem in that because she, there's no direct contact with it if she reads it from a mobile or from a pda or from a computer or from a book of tafsir because tafsir has the Arabic Quran, but alongside it, a lot of words that are not from the Quran. Then in this case, she's okay to do that without any problem. And Allah knows best. Nam Sheikh, this one is asking, uh, how do I explain myself to a non-Muslim that Allah is one with a clear evidence? Do I need to put more effort? If you want to give da'wah to a non-Muslim, to explain to him that Allah is one, this non-Muslim, either he's a Christian or a Jew or following other religions. If he is a Jew, then you have no problem. Jews believe in the oneness of Allah. If he's a Christian, also you are mainly not having any problem because the vast majority of Christians acknowledge that Allah the creator, what they call the father in heaven, is one. And the majority of them don't believe that Jesus Christ, who was a human, who was born to a woman, who was crucified, as they believe, we do not believe Muslims that he was crucified. They don't believe deep down that he is God or the son of God. They are confused. And it's difficult for them to believe, though they say it, yes, it's three in one. He is the son of God, that God was him, and he was this and that. And if you ask them random questions, you will cast doubt in their hearts that we, they will never be able to get over that. So you have to talk to them and see. Tell them if they're Christians. If Jesus is God, then who was in the uterus or in the, you, in the womb of Mary, the virgin? If they say it was Allah, then who was running the universe? So, oh, no, 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 it, it was Allah and it was a father. And how can it be? If you say that Jesus is the son of God, so do you mean to tell me that he was born? said, yes. said, okay, before he was born, what was he? He wouldn't find an answer. said, if a God is born, he cannot be God. A true God must not be born. He's not born, does not beget, is not begotten. Let us assume that he's the son of God. Now, if you have four children, Three of them, rude, abusive, and disobedient. And one of them is kind, loving, obedient, and a coolness to your eye. Would any man be considered to be sane, to kill the good child, the good son, so that he can forgive the other three? Or would you kill the other three? How dare you say that 
Allah crucified his beloved son for the sins of the son of Adam. Why would he crucify the good one and leave the bad ones? This doesn't make any sense. And the scripture itself says that the so-claimed Jesus, when he was crucified, he was shouting that, why have you forsaken me? So who is he shouting to? To his father? Why would he shout? He's God. He can release himself. And if he was crucified for the sins of mankind, what about the sins before him? From Adam to his time, who will have redemption of it? It's, there are basics. There are logic, logical questions, not only to mm -hmm. Christians, to normal people that you can ask and you can take them out to believe that there's only one creator, one God of this universe. Allah knows best. Nasser. I got, are you guys listening? One well, yes is enough. I'm sure. Okay, alhamdulillah. So inshallah, Sheikh, uh, I think we'll uh, just take one, two more questions and then we end for today's session, inshallah. Inshallah. And the next question is, um, do I have to follow a particular madhab? The issue of madhab and following a particular madhab depends on the person asking. If someone says to me, Sheikh, I am totally ignorant. I don't know the difference between Quran and Hadith. I have no knowledge, none whatsoever in the basics. And I'm a blind man. I don't know what to do. Such a person, we tell him that you follow one madhab. Or follow one sheikh that you trust, that you believe he's righteous and practicing, and that he knows what he's doing. And whatever he tells you, you do it. Because on the day of judgment, Allah Azza wa Jal knows that you're not capable of finding the truth for you by yourself. But if you're someone, who's a little bit knowledgeable, has the ability to search whether the hadith is authentic or not. In this case, you cannot follow a particular madhab because Allah tells us in the Quran to obey Allah and to obey the messenger and those of knowledge or of authority of us. So obeying Allah is to follow the Quran. Obeying the Prophet is to follow the Sunnah. And if you know that the madhab you're following is going against the Sunnah, instead of justifying it for your madhab, follow your Prophet والسلام, in what he had commanded you to do. This is what any Muslim should do, and Allah knows best. Namshek, the next question is, uh, please, is it allowed for someone to learn the Holy Quran with mobile application, such as Quran Light? Is it allowed to what? No, sir. Is it allowed to learn from mobile uh, uh, apps? Yes, of course. Akhi, the mobile app I have on uh, uh, Quran app on my mobile is the, the word of Allah. But it is in digital form. So it's X and zeros or I's, ones and zeros. Once I turn it off, there's no Quran. If I go to the bathroom with it, there's no problem. Providing I don't turn it on. Once I turn it on, khalas, it becomes prohibited for me to use it because the Quran is visible. So we can learn the meeting is being recorded. Thank you, Magasati. So um, it is permissible to read from 
the Quran and to uh, use it during Taraweeh. So when I stand in Taraweeh, I read the Quran one juzo or two juzo. That's totally permissible and to learn it and to memorize the Quran from it. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Uh, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, Sheikh. Do you mind we take one extra and we end? I don't mind, but where do you go when I, you, you ask a question and you go get your coffee? It's it's uh, fasting time. Astaghfirullah, Sheikh. The network's a bit terrible down here, that's why. But now it's good, inshallah. <laughs> okay, give me a question. All right, Sheikh. Um, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Can we literally look at a hard copy to recite the kunut in the witr? While we're praying, with the, can we look at the book to recite kunut while we are doing our salah, the witr? Okay, first of all, we've stated that Qunut itself is not something that the Prophet used to do all the time. Actually, it was never reported that he had done it, but he taught his grandson Hassan how to say it. So if you want to only read the short version, which he taught Hassan, no problem. But if you're going to bring a book and you start flipping the pages, and read like for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. No, this is not at all recommended. Say the dua that you memorized and that would be more than sufficient and enough, insha'Allah, Azza wa Jal. Now, next question. In this quarantine period, Sheikh, we pray Jumu'at at home or non-Jumu'at masjid, five daily prayers masjid. Is it, is it recommended to pray in congregation? If yes, are we to pray the two? Uh, the two rakaat of Juma or pray the Zuhur prayer normally? Well, if you are in Nigeria or in Saudi Arabia where I am or in the Gulf or in Malaysia, which is the Muslim country, then if you do not pray Juma in the masjid, you pray it Zuhur in your home. There's no problem in collecting your brothers and praying Zuhur for rakaat in congregation home, but you do not pray the Jumu'ah, because the Jumu'ah in Muslim countries require the permission of the, the, uh, the Muslim ruler who is the, the great Imam. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. All right. Uh, what is the ruling if a menstruating woman becomes pure the night before or in the midnight and didn't take her bath and also didn't wake up for support? On waking up for Fajr, can she fast for the day? Is the fast valid if she baths after Fajr? Let's say 8 a.m. is her fast valid. So what counts is the knowledge of her purity. Was it before Fajr or after Fajr? If a woman found out that she is pure from her menses seconds before the Adhan of Fajr and she intended to fast, her fast is valid. Now. So... The adhan is given, she had not taken her ghusl, no problem, she's pure, so the, the fasting is valid. But if a woman went to bed before Fajr, saying that, I'm not sure if I'm pure or not, but if I'm pure, I would fast. She wakes up an hour after adhan of Fajr, and she finds out that she's pure. We ask her, are you certain that you became pure? Before the adhan, she said, no, how would I know? I was asleep. In this case, she cannot fast, and that, that day is not counted out of Ramadan. So, Sheikh, what if her menses goes past 15 days? What should she do? The menses cannot exceed half of the month. So mm -hmm. if a woman period is prolonged, once it reaches 15 days in total, she must perform ghusl, she must fast and pray, but she pray, performs wudu after every adhan, after cleaning herself, and she can pray as long as she wants until the time is out. Now, Shep, so how many rakaat is recommended for tarawih? Did you say last question? This will be the last question, inshallah. How many rakaat is recommended? I've been counting. You know, you said last question, and this is number five. Who's counting? So, what is the number of taraweeh rakaat? This is an issue of dispute among the scholars. Some take the extreme opinion, saying that it must not 
go or exceed over 11. Because the Prophet, according to the hadith of Aisha, radiallahu anha, in Sahih Muslim and elsewhere, that she told someone who asked her, how many rak'ahs did the Prophet perform in Ramadan? She said, he never performed in Ramadan or outside Ramadan more than 11 rak'ahs. But there is another hadith by Aisha herself and by Ibn Abbas, the Prophet used to pray 13 rak'ahs. And when a man came to the Prophet asking him in front of all the Muslims, O oh, Prophet of Allah, tell, tell me about night prayer. So the Prophet told him, night prayer is prayed in twos, in twos, two by twos. And if you fear Fajr, offer one rak'ah of witr. In this hadith, the man is ignorant and he came to be taught by the Prophet who told him the format, which is two by two, but he did not set to him the max, which is 11, according to what the other party says, which means that if 11 was the best and one should not go over that, the Prophet would have told him. But due to the fact that the Prophet did not tell him, this means that the sky is the limit. It's up to your preference. You want to pray 11 to be safe? That's great. You want to pray 23 so that you would shorten the amount of time needed to stand for prayer while reciting more Quran? This is also perfect and legitimate and there's no problem. It's not 11, 23 or 40. Uh, uh, seven or whatever. No, no. It, the sky is the limit and it's open for you to choose whatever you feel comfortable with and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Uh, mashallah, tabarakallah. Before we, we end, uh, for those, there's a controversy going on here with uh, the Q&A about the woman's voice. So maybe you can answer that today or tomorrow, inshallah. You want it today? Yes, if you can, inshallah. Then we'll end with this. Okay, the voice of a woman is not aura. No one had ever said that a woman should not speak. Actually, in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal addressed the mothers of the believers, our mothers, the wives of the Prophet Sallam, that when they speak, they must not soften their voices so that a person with illness in his heart would not be tempted. Which means that women by nature have a soft voice. And subhanAllah, my wife always makes an issue out of that. And she says, whenever someone calls you on the mobile for questions, I know if it's a man or a woman. So I said, subhanAllah, how do you know that? He said, by the way, you reply to the salam. So if it's a man, you say, naam. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. And if it's a woman, you would say, Naam, wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. And of course, this is an exaggeration. I do not do this. Actually, the sisters that call me know for sure that I don't give them any slack. And I don't take it easy on them because shaitan is there. Sometimes sisters call just to vent or to complain of their husbands or of betrayals or so on. And they need someone to talk to, they need a shoulder to lean on. And this is where shaitan comes. And this is why I don't open the door at all to such incidents. But this is what the observation of my wife is. So generally speaking, yes, the voice of a woman has an impact on men. And this is why Allah told women not to soften their voices. When a woman talks normally, there is no problem. Sisters, Daughters call me on the phone all the time asking questions, no problem. Sisters call uh, um, telephone operators, they call the hospitals, the doctors, they call asking for groceries, they talk to the driver, they talk to the pharmacists, no problem. So speaking is no problem when there is a legitimate reason for it. But when a woman comes and recites the Quran, she's not going to say, 
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم like the old sheikh of haram we used to be touched by their beautiful recitation though some cultures would say oh what is this kind of recitation the women were going to say in a beautiful melodic voice that would turn men's head around and this is not permissible so the most authentic opinion is that the competitions that we see on tv or on videos where women come and recite the quran in front of men this is totally not permissible and this defies the purpose of true and real hijab and allah azza wa jalla knows best inshallah tabarakallah jazakallah khair ya sheikh it's been a beautiful class inshallah we we'll all go back and uh, ponder on the page we did today inshallah and you can ask us questions by tomorrow and uh, we continue with the class inshallah for tomorrow by tomorrow barakallahu feekum jazakumullahu khair wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh eat your hearts out we have like an hour and a half for no less than an hour we have a uh, 15 minutes for fatur so we're going to eat fatur and you guys keep on fasting inshallah inshallah allah yabarik shaykh assalam alaykum see you tomorrow inshallah same time wa alaykum assalam wa barakat all right uh, alhamdulillah so this has been a beautiful class alhamdulillah so by tomorrow inshallah we want to invite one of you to come in early as usual and uh, we hope we try to increase the classes for the sheikh inshallah uh i don't know if any further questions can be sent to the whatsapp group inshallah so please and please if you're not in the whatsapp group or you haven't been receiving our emails can you just send us a message via the whatsapp group inshallah uh please the whatsapp number abdul jabbar you just Okay, well, the link will be shared to you, inshallah. So, whatever way you yes, can. Can you put the link now? Yeah, I'll put it up now. All right. So, those are asking for the WhatsApp number. You can get the link down right now, inshallah. Then you join the room. No. Is there anything you want to say to them? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. All right. And uh, may Allah make it easy for us. So, let me just wait for Jabbar to put the link up and then we end. So inshallah the book we sent to you again please we are, we are we are begging it and everyone you can send the questions privately to us and then we can address it by tomorrow inshallah uh, also um, i encourage you all to please ready. go through the book um, we we'll did open a group chat for questions now. as well we we'll open a group right. chat strictly for questions so i'll put the link here Jabbar? Um, we'll put a link up for questions as well. So directly questions can be raised there. Because there are still a lot of questions that haven't been answered yet. So people can send their questions. Okay, some people don't even know about the book. Uh, there's a book, the book we're studying Well, thank God, someone just sent it. Uthul al-Thalatha. So someone just sent it now. Uh, there's a link to the book, so you can... Hello? <laughs> Um, so I'll put up the group chat for people to join. Okay, so the group chats are up. You can join them, inshallah. Um, those look at the message from the panelists. You can join the group chat from there, inshallah.
Aisha Shitu, you can just look at the message up. You can just follow the WhatsApp you shared. The Telegram, we will try to go to see if it's workable. Because we thought that a lot of people don't know about Telegram, but we'll discuss, inshallah, with the team, and then we will get back to you, inshallah. All right, Jazakumullah khair and see you guys tomorrow, same time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>